information. I got all the size and the shape working for statement away. It's also sometimes called ditch gravity duality. I should just alert you that the ordering here is switched between the two sides. The gravity refers to the AES, and the gauge theory is the CFT. Okay, but what they say is that certain uh, spin theory, which in particular is a theory of gravity, on asymptotically AES psi plus E psi is dual, meaning physically equivalent to a certain uh, you know, maximally symmetric Foucault and Will theory, which is a conformal field theory, uh, uh, living in. In fact, as you can think of it as living in from the boundary of AES, yes, so it's a different living in the boundary of this. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry, let's go. Okay. What do I say about this? Well, just first of all, pictorially, uh, you can think of, so we'll, we'll, we'll see this in a moment, you can think of ADS. Um, space time as uh, you can write, oops, you can draw a compactified space time where this is time. Um, okay, and then there's some uh, um, spatial geometry here as the ADS. So, this is what sometimes I, everyone refers to as the bulk. So this is where the string theory lives, or the theory of gravity. And as a nice mnemonic, you can think of the dual CFT as really living on the boundary. And so in the early days, the people used to say this nice soup-can analogy. So this looks like a soup-can, or can of anything, and people sort of made the analogy that the gravity is like the soup inside the can, and, uh, but in the CFT is like the label of the can, but unlike the ordinary soup can where the label just gives you a rough idea of, of what's inside, here the label actually is equivalent, it tells you everything. Okay, so, um, so that's the sort of the picture to keep in mind. And what I wanted to just uh, conclude from yesterday was to sort of repeat some of the things, summarize some of the things remarks I made about this uh, correspondence. So one obvious thing is that it relates a theory of gravity uh, to a non-gravitational theory. So string theory um, to, and this contains, I mean, you, you, you should think of it as the, the, the two sides, um, being full autonomous theories. We don't have the completion, you know, the full UV completion, uh, or at least we, we don't know how to describe it, how to control it, but this is meant to be the full sort of quantum theory of gravity. And it's dual to a conformal field theory, the gauge theory, which doesn't have any manifest gravitational dynamics. So non-gravitational theory. Of course, they're dual, so um, uh, in that sense, maybe it's not, a, I mean, it's a confusing thing to say, um, but so they're equivalent, so if this has gravity, this has the same physics, but in completely non-manifest way. So the gravity here emerges uh, in some mysterious way. You know, Einstein's equations, dynamical space-time, we don't see that on the side at all. And it's still a big question of how does space-time, the full dynamical space-time, emerge from some non-gravitational, and in some sense, maybe people think of that this more fundamental uh, degrees of freedom. Okay, so um, one hopes to be able to use this correspondence to answer long-standing questions of quantum gravity by recasting them in the non-gravitational language, 
work. Okay, the puzzles associated with the gravity are now rephrased. And the hope is that, well, that makes things hope maybe simpler to answer, and then translate back. Now, of course, to do that, uh, you have to understand the dictionary between the two sides sufficiently well. And you know, over the decade and two, two and a half decades uh, since the formulation of this, people have been developing the dictionary uh, to you know, exquisite detail, but still we're very far from answering the really interesting questions. You know, what happens to an observer who falls into a black hole and ends classically at the singularity? Well, of course, physics knows what to do, even though the theory that we're using breaks down. So what is it? Presumably, the answer lies in here, but how do we extract it? So we still don't know, uh, but you know, we, the, the, the field is evolving, um, um, especially, well, it used to be that most of the information flow uh, went sort of in this direction. It turns out that it's much easier to do calculations, say, in classical gravity, to find out some problem in you know, complicated, strongly coupled quantum many body system. And so people used classical gravity calculations to learn about these systems, which we didn't have any other handle on. But more recently, the focus has switched, or at least expanded into going in this direction. Of course, the hope was there from the very beginning, but you can use, even though we don't have concrete handle on many things, we have various, we know various properties of quantum field theories. You know, even things like unitarity, well, you can use that to make statements about the dual side. Okay, so now we have you know, information flow in both ways. So this is a very, I mean, I guess this is its most important um, aspect. The reason that it's not trivial to learn about quantum gravity is that we don't have, we still don't have a good enough handle. And in particular, one, one snag is that it's a, what people call a strong, weak, move this up, um, strong, weak coupling duality. Okay, what that refers to is um, that, I mean, this is a bit of a misnomer because you have a, as I told you yesterday, you have two parameters on, you know, on each side. You have the string, uh, well, the, the, the ratio of the ADS scale to the string length, and you have the string coupling, and here you have the rank of the gauge group, and uh, you have the tooth coupling. So it's really a two-parameter space you should be talking about. But certainly what we saw is that the classical gravity was in the regime where you have the truth coupling very large. So you're in strongly coupled uh, CFT. But uh, at the same time, in order to suppress the quantum effects, the g-string was a ratio of lambda to n. You have to have lambda much smaller than n. And that's weak, up, weak coupling, weak, weak string coupling. So for having the gravity side well behaved, you're in this regime where perturbative techniques are not uh, applicable. So that makes this program challenging, very challenging. OK, the most mysterious uh, aspect of the duality is that it's holographic. Holographic, again, just refers to the uh, fact that the two theories live in different dimensions. Okay, this is four-dimensional theory. This is ten-dimensional theory, which you can reduce down. If nothing is happening, nothing interesting is happening on the five sphere, you can think about it as ADS five CFT four, um, or you know, there are many other examples. It's always uh, the CFT being one dimension less than ADS because it's, as I said, in some sense living on the boundary of ADS, and that's partly what sort of screwing up our intuition, because you see, the CFT lives on some space, space time, but that space time is non-dynamical. As I said, there is no gravity on the side. So even though you have a space time, lower dimensional one, even that the directions in the CFT are not really 
um, you know, that the, the, they near the boundary, they correspond to the directions in the bulk, but we don't really have a detailed sense of, you know, if you're somewhere in the bulk, what is the, what quantity does that correspond to in, in, the, in the CFT? So all the directions here, in some sense, emerge, but how do you see it? Well, you see only the, you, you might have a guess about the ones that you have space-time related to a space-time, but the rest of the directions, let's say the radial direction, is much more mysterious. It's something completely different. As I said last time, it's something like the energy scale in the CFT, but why should energy scale have anything to do with the space on which the CFT lives? We don't see a manifest symmetry. On the other hand, if we're just a, you know, an observer in the bulk, all of these directions look the same to us. We can't say, okay, that's the radial direction, that's the angular direction. You know, it's, I mean, if, if you have a sufficiently symmetric space time, there's some geometrical meaning to saying that, but in general, you, you might not have any symmetries. You can excite ADS with gravitational waves, and then it's totally meaningless what is the radial direction versus the other directions. But the CFT doesn't manifest that. It has some fixed background, it has some scale, but you don't see this bulk covariance reflected in the CFT, but it has to be there. It has to be there, it's just not manifest. Okay, so, so that's, the, that's sort of the mysterious um, aspect of it. On the other hand, it's, it's very, uh, well, as I said, it's, it's, it's highly non-trivial, and um, after many, many uh, tests, it still holds water, so, I mean, most of the community I mean, the question has shifted from, you know, can we disprove it uh, to what can we do with it or how does it really work? But it's not just that you're, you know, you're matching symmetries or uh, kinematics or something like that. You can ask detailed dynamical questions. The language in which you describe the situation is very different on the two sides and yet they agree. Okay. So, and it's not just this one example that I showed you, that sort of sketched out for you, or described the sort of construction, but you have many diff other examples too. I mean, you can have you know, M theory on ADS4 cross S7, dual to some three dimensional CFT. You can have M theory on ADS7 cross S4, dual to a four dimensional CFT. You can reduce everything, have string theory on ADS3 cross S3 cross let's say T4, K3 again dual now to a two-dimensional CFT, which is very handy because we know how to compute lots of things with that, and so forth. You can, once you have a correspondence like this, you can start deforming both theories and have sort of um, non-ADS asymptotics and break the conformal symmetry and so forth. So you can sort of, once, you're, once you anchor yourself in some construction, you can sort of now sneak away from it. You can, in fact, drop you know, the string theory context entirely and just deal at the level of, you know, some, um, you know, bulk theory dual to uh, something, but, but depending on what you do, you might, the questions you might ask may not be sensitive to the microscopics or they may be, so you have to be careful, you know, you can't just blindly push it arbitrarily, but it's just, it's, it's sort of, um, what did I want to say, I guess, something like uh, uh, generalizes um, too many concepts you know, context, so it's uh, um, a family of dualities in some sense. Okay, so that was most of what I wanted to say as far as the remarks go, and so what I wanted to do or focus on in this lecture is start to develop the dictionary, but before delving into the dictionary, lots of the dictionary is obtained by just looking at the geometry of ADS. So eventually we'll talk about asymptotically ADS spacetimes without any symmetries whatsoever, but for now I'll talk about just the pure ADS, okay, so it's maximally um, symmetric uh, negatively curved spacetime. And let me do it in arbitrary 
say, d plus 1 dimension, so d spatial and 1 time dimensions. Um, okay, so this is, you can think of this as, you know, maximally symmetric. Uh, solution to Einstein's equations with negative cosmological constant um, and no matter, so just vacuum solution. The symmetry is SO d comma 2, and as Roberto had uh, showed us for ADS3 and ADS2, and you can see it trivialized, trivially generalizes to, you know, arbitrarily dimensional ADS, you can think of this, but to manifest these symmetries, you can, of course, write it, write a metric, a line element that has, uh, that manifests all these symmetries, because you don't have commuting killing fields uh, for all of them. They don't commute. So, you know, like you, you can't manifest SO3 by writing a uh, two, three, two sphere metric. Similarly, here you can't do it with a single line element, but you can write it as an embedding of a hyperboloid in a uh, flat space-time, space-time with, with now two, two time directions. And then, depending on what uh, embedding uh, you choose, you get different line elements that then manifest different, uh, different symmetries, different parts of this. OK, so, so, so we can manifest the full thing by uh, writing this as um, a hyperboloid. So this is identical to what Roberto was saying. Um, so it, let me pick x, let's say minus one, and x zero as the time, time-like, as the, as the axis for the time-like directions. So we have minus x one squared minus x zero squared, and then plus x1 squared plus dot, 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 up to xd. Okay, so for Roberto, we had d equal to 2 or 3. So this was uh, short. And now this is minus the ADS psi squared. And this is all in the metric of the, you know, in r 2 comma d, or d comma 2, depending on your, I guess I should say d comma 2. Be consistent with this, um, with ds squared is minus dx1 squared minus, sorry, minus 1 squared minus dx0 squared plus dx1 squared all the way up to um, dxd squared. Okay, so now uh, I'll mostly talk about two uh, groupings, two embeddings. One is the sort of the more obvious one is group these two and these d directions. So you get uh, the SOD symmetry. So there will be a d minus one sphere. So it will be manifestly spherically symmetric and it will be manifestly static. Okay, so this is what will give you the global ADS. So that's the thing that, um, so we have seen that in, in the previous lecture. In, in Roberto's lecture. So I want to write down the embedding, uh, you know, as uh, um, um, I, I leave that as an exercise for you to see explicitly. But it's basically what Roberto has written. In, in, it's just that you have to generalize the two sphere to a d sphere, or whatever d minus one sphere. Um, so we have the line element. Let me use coordinates instead of t. I'll use tau rho instead of for the radial coordinate, and then there will be a set of angles for the d minus 1 sphere. So we have minus 1 plus rho squared over L squared 
V tau squared plus V rho squared over the same thing, 1 plus rho squared over L squared, uh, plus rho squared uh, V omega V minus 1 squared. Okay, so this has uh, D minus 1, D, D plus 1. Uh, so it's ADS D plus 1. And um, so this is, this is what's called the global ADS. And you can see that it's manifestly static and spherical symmetric. And the boundary is at, well, where these things, where you get to infinite proper distances for finite coordinate distance as rho goes to infinity. And so you can see, so the, in that diagram, this, this subcam picture, this is really, well, um, the T really would be, sorry, the tau is really going in this direction. Rho is not quite the linear coordinate on the blackboard because I'm drawing the boundary here. So this is rho equal to infinity. This would be rho equal to zero. So this is this sort of the, like a rescaled rho coordinate. And then the omega d minus one uh, is the rotation in this. So instead of disk here, or circle here, we would have the d minus one sphere. Okay, so that's, and you can see that, you can check that this space time, this coordinate patch covers the entire thing. It's geodesically complete. Okay, so we're not missing anything. This is all there is to the space time. So this covers the whole thing. But we don't see the metric in the form that I have been deriving yesterday. Okay, so that's not quite the thing that manifests uh, Lorentzian uh, symmetry in D dimensions, or really Poincaré symmetry in D dimensions. So that's another, uh, another way of choosing the embedding. That's much trickier way, by the way, but I'll leave it as an interesting exercise for you to try to derive what is the embedding for the following. So I said this, this one is pretty trivial. And this is the so-called Poincaré ADS. I'll use the standard T and let's say X and which I'll group into X mu. Um, and um, what do I want to use, like a Z. And that metric, so again, the, the exercise is to uh, find, you know, those capital X's of these coordinates as explicit functions to get the ADS as I have been writing it last time. So the line element here was L squared over Z squared um, minus DT squared plus, um, well, you know, DXI, DXI. Um, so th this was my Minkowski metric, eta mu nu, DX mu, DX nu. And then we had the plus DZ squared. Okay, so that was what I was writing down last time. Okay, so you can, you can obtain that by, you know, effectively by a different grouping. What you want to do is something, sort of work backwards from getting this, uh, the full symmetry. And so now what we see, so it has, so it's, you know, Poincaré symmetric in the dimensions. It's uh, the boundary is now at z equal to zero. That's where this gets infinitely large. But uh, it's not geodesically complete. Why is it not geodesically complete? Well, z equal to zero uh, is the boundary. That's fine. But what happens as z goes to infinity? As z goes to infinity, this thing's die down, and you can, you can get to z equal to infinity in finite proper distance. Let's say along space like 
or null or whatever um, trajectories. So, and that's called the Poincare horizon. Um, so there's a horizon. Well, let me write that. at z equal to infinity. So we can extend past that. And so in particular, this Poincaré patch, Poincaré ideas, is something that's just embedded, or not embedded, that's just a patch of the space time. So what does that look like? So with respect to the global ideas, let me try to draw a bigger picture here. Well, you can see that DDT is null at z equal to infinity. And, um, well, uh, and you can think of this as, um, so, so, so the, the boundary of this patch will be null. And in fact, uh, you can convince yourself that the boundary must be one that you know, starts from, um, the, the global ADS boundary, so you have these two null planes. Okay, so this corresponds, so this is equal to zero. Um, and if you had a surface here, that would be t equal to zero surface. So z equal to zero is on the boundary t equal to zero here is, is, is this, uh, what would be also tau equal to zero. But now, as you come up here, this is already t equal to infinity and t equal to minus infinity. And z itself gets to infinity along, well, along these full horizons. So you have to extend, you have to take multiple Poincaré patches, infinitely many Poincaré patches, to fill up the entire uh, global ADS. So once you, so you can write the explicit coordinate transformation to go between this rho tau omega coordinates to these Txz coordinates. The easiest way to figure out what that coordinate transformation is I mean, you might be tempted to say, well, this is static, that is static. Maybe we can match the time likening fields. But that's not what happens. They don't match up that nicely. And so if you sort of try to do it by brute force of just finding the coordinate transformation by saying, well, you know, you have some row of uh, z, x, t, what would be then the metric and try to match up with that, that's horrendous. So the easiest way to figure out what that coordinate transformation is, is to go back to the embedding and use the coordinate transformation by equating the you know, x naught to x naught and so forth. Um, so, but I'm just showing you where the limits of, this, of these coordinates are to sort of get some better feel for how do you, how do you go between these. A more convenient way, so I, I'll, I'll keep, I'll, keep populating this diagram, but let me just say before, before drawing things on here, one might first draw various things in, in Poincaré ADS in something that manifests this symmetry. So I can, so yesterday I was drawing um, a picture at, let's say a spatial, just spatial picture at constant, constant time where you can think of the UV scale as z equal to zero, you have some z direction and you have some x direction. So let's pick one of these x's. And then t is just fixed to be constant. Uh, and then you can ask, well, okay, so what is, let's say, so z equal to zero is this whole boundary. That's 
at that point in this entire circle. So this line, uh, now I'll start using colors. So <laughs> this line, z equal to zero, is the thing that maps into the circle. So now this half plane gets conformally compactified to, uh, to, to the circle, which is something called, the, let me actually draw two pictures. Let me draw the t equal to zero slice and let me draw also the, um, but let me draw that in the Poincare coordinates and in the, in the global coordinates. So in the global coordinates that is called Poincare disk. And really, I want to think of this as a constant time slice in global ADS, so for global coordinates, but this coincide. Okay, so it's like a top-down view. This is like a top-down view of that. This is a conformal, conformally transformed half plane. And so, and here the z equal to zero, z equal to zero curve is just the circle. Okay, so that's z equal to zero. Now, what about, let's say, uh, some finite z? Well, finite z, but let me also label the point x equal to zero. x equal to zero, let's say, would be here, this, this whole trajectory. So let's say that that will be here. Um, now, some finite x, what does that look like? Um, we can, or well, let, let, let's ask what is x equal to infinity. So you go here, you, go, you don't see it, of course, because it doesn't fit on the blackboard. Here it's conformally compactified, it's on the other side. So this would be x equal to infinity, x equal to zero. And various x's in between would be, actually, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that maybe this is, I should shift this so that it will be more comparable to that. So this will be x equal to zero. I've just now rotated it so that it's like, um, you can make this connection better. So this would be x equal to infinity. So x equal to infinity is all on this point. And in between, uh, x equal to L would be something that's in this characteristic, uh, uh, size of ADS, uh, you would have a circle that, well, going from, so this is a singular uh, coordinate singularity. So constant x, x equal to L, would be something like this. On the other hand, Let's say we fix constant, um, constant x. Okay, let, 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 let's ask what is z equal, to, uh, z equal to L. So constant z, z goes from zero to infinity. So where is z equal to one, or sorry, z equal to L? Z equal to L would be one that looks like this. So this surface, so now if you, if you vary x, you fix z equal to l and you vary x, you populate a slice that's sort of curving away from the boundary like this, but also wraps, wraps around in this way. Here you don't see it because here we're varying, this is parameterized by time. Here we have fixed the time, so this would be just here you would just see that as, as a single point. Is that somewhat, are, are you getting somewhat of a sense? Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so maybe I should start going. Um, so let me do, draw the orbits. Uh, can I go on? Uh, yeah. Mm. Sorry, you're completely right. Yes, 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 yes. I am getting, yes, <laughs> I agree. Uh, yes, this is z is equal to l, uh, parameterized by x. 
going from x equal to 0 all the way to infinity. Very good. Thank you. I apologize for that. Um, is that clear? OK. Um, good. So let's talk about the, so the, symmet the translational symmetry in x is something that goes at constant z and constant t. So that goes like this. So this is dx. Here the dx, what I really meant to label it is by dx. So um, that was the screw up. So dx is the thing that, again, goes at constant t and constant z. On the other hand, well, here the sphere, spherical killing fields are the, the ones that just rotate the diagram, which don't get, which don't get manifested nicely. It's some combination of uh, you know, dx and uh, dz. But the, similarly for the time-like killing fields, the, okay, I can draw this in red, the dt killing field manifesting staticity of this one is one that goes like this. So this is dt, which, so this is like a boost for, uh, in, with respect to this wedge, whereas the dt is just something that goes everywhere up. Sorry, d, d tau is just everywhere, something that goes everywhere up. That's the staticity, explicit staticity of the, in the global coordinates. Okay, so that's, um, that probably is, okay, so now I can also ask what is the boundary, uh, what is the geometry on the boundary? Well, here, we go to z equal to 0, and the geometry is just Minkowski space time. So the CFT, so we formulated uh, the original idea CFT as having arising from near horizon geometry of a D3 brain world volume, sorry, from a D3 brain um, geometry. So the world volume manifested this. Uh, four dimensional, it was just a flat brain. So we had flat Minkowski space time um, induced from that. Uh, so the boundary geometry of Poincare ADS is just four dimensional Minkowski. On the other hand, for the global ADS, what do we do? We go to rho equal to infinity. And then here we can strip off the conformal factor. So in both cases, we can strip off the conformal factor because it's a CFT, conformal field theory. It doesn't care about the conformal factor on, of the metric on which it lives. So here we just have, you can take out the rho squared over L squared, and the boundary metric for the global is, so boundary metric is then conformal to it's still conformally flat, but it's conformal in particular to um, just the um, um, Einstein static universe minus d tau squared plus of characteristic size given by this L, um, d omega d minus 1 squared. So this is really Einstein static universe, which you can think of, well, which is just this, this uh, empty cylinder. And so now you can see implemented very nicely what uh, Malcolm was uh, showing you in the first lecture, the, point gar the, the Penrose diagram for the flat space for Minkowski, you can think of as uh, described as drawn conveniently on the Einstein static universe, where here you have I naught, this point, here you have I plus and I minus, and these white curves, so this is cry minus, scry minus, and this would be scry plus, and scry plus. Yeah. Okay, 
using the tech font rather than the curly one. Okay, so that's, so if, if you unwrap this, that would give you the Penrose diagram for Minkowski space-time. That's just the boundary space-time. Now the ADS geometry fills this in. And it fills it in in such a way that the Poincaré patch that limits onto that is delimited by the Poincaré horizons. And so you can, in, take, in, in fact, um, think of that space-time now in sort of a written as a causal set, you can think of that space-time as, um, in very, very variety of ways, you can, you can think of this as, for example, the complement of the causal future of this I0 uh, union causal past. This is just a causal past, not, not, not sky, this is uh, not script I causal past of spatial infinity, complement of that, okay, so we're saying Poincaré patch is everything that's not in the causal future or causal past of this point, or you can think of it as the union of uh, the causal past, sorry, the intersection of um, the causal past of, uh, strictly speaking, this was um, chronological. Now it's really going to be causal. Causal past of I plus intersection causal future of I minus. Okay, th these are the same sets, and both of them are that point carrier patch. Just to give you, start giving you a practice with writing these causal sets. An interesting exercise for those who, ha who have. I mean, already know all this stuff, is to figure out what happens, how do you define Poincaré ADS when you excite the geometry and it's just asymptotically ADS? Yeah, that is a throwaway um, thing. Okay, good. So let me pause to see if there are any questions on that. Okay, so that was trying to get a sense of ADS just by relating coordinates, because after all, these coordinate systems are useful. Uh, they manifest different symmetries, so you, you, you see different ones being applied to different questions, okay, because it's a matter of convenience. Um, and it's useful to be proficient in both of them. In fact, this is like a limit of the Rindler ADS that Roberto was talking about, so just draw it, just draw it as an aside here. So if you consider the global ADS, let me just take a cross section, or think of the two-dimensional one. So this is the global ADS. Um, if you take a horizon, if you do Rindler ADS, well, you, you, you have it with the bifurcation surface somewhere in the middle. The limit of that thing, as you take the bifurcation surface all the way to infinity, okay, it's like extremizing a uh, Reissner extreme black hole. You extremize the black hole, the bifurcation surface disappears, it goes all the way to what like, looks like going to the singularity. It's still going on the Penrose diagram. It's still it's getting infinitely far away spatially. It gets to zero temperature, just like it's going to get here. And that's the so as I take this point all the way to the boundary, that really is what's the limit that's giving me Poincaré ADS. Okay. Those are just words. I mean, when you try to work it out, you have to be very careful about the coordinate singularities. But just as a pictorial um, or intuitive crutch, it's, it's, there's, there's a connection between all of those that you have, you have seen. Good. So another way... Other than thinking about the various coordinate systems of talking about what the geometry of a spacetime looks like is by looking at some you know, covariant quantities in it that, that don't rely on specifying coordinates. So in particular, the easiest thing to do is to talk about what geodesics look like. Okay, so 
let me tell you and leave it as an exercise for you to work out explicitly what geodesics of various signatures um, look like on ADS. Okay, so as a probe of that spatial geometry, sorry, I'm too short. <laughs> Okay, and I'll be drawing just a 3D picture, maybe even the 2D picture. Well, let's do 3D picture. Um, and typically, if you want to see what observers feel, what geometry observers feel, um, then you want to talk about time-like um, geodesic. So for, for time-like geodesics, it's not going to... this. Constant time surface is not going to be relevant just yet, but I'll, uh, so this is at t equal to zero, we'll have this, I just want to mimic these two pictures, but they won't come in just yet. For time-like time -like geodesics, well, clearly by symmetry, one time-like geodesic is just, is just this. That happens to coincide with the orbit of the dd tau uh, at rho equal to zero, but orbit of dd tau at rho equal to anything else is not a ge geodesic. Physically, ADS feels like a confining box, and so if you put something here, it will want to fall towards ADS. And in fact, if you write the geodesic equation, the potential is like a harmonic oscillator. So no matter how much you displace it, the period, so it oscillates like a harmonic os oscillator, sinusoidally, but it oscillates with the same period for any amplitude. So a geodesic, so if this is the ADS, this is roughly speaking the ADS scale, so it oscillates. So here, if we take a null geodesic, actually this is a good trick, that's like an infinite energy limit of a time-like geodesic, okay? So there's a this set of two null geodesics describes for you a period, and then all the time-like geodesics here have the same period. So they all slosh back and forth. Um, so if I had rescaled this picture or drew it bigger, they would all do you know, this on the scale of 2 pi times L. Okay, so all of them that are, sorry, all of them that have fixed angles look like this. The ones that don't have fixed angles orbit around, but again with the same periodicity. So it's like you can have a um, um, orbit that orbits around the center of ADS. Uh, so it's that, that's going to be harder to draw, but it's, 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 it's going to have the same periodicity. Okay, so that's time-like geodesics. And in particular, one curious thing that follows from this is that if you have a point, let's say point P, but, or let me just use the symmetries to say point P is here. If you take a point Q, Q is really in the uh, causal future of P, right? Because there is a time-like curve that connects uh, Q to P, but there is no time-like geodesic connecting Q and P. So you can't get to Q from P by geodesic. You really have to accelerate to get there. We're not familiar with that from flat space time because there you can find a time like geodesic any, between any two time like separated points. So, this is a bit of a novelty. The non geodesics, well, as I said, you can think of them as limit of the time like ones, but the interesting part um, is once, okay, let me, let me shift to fitting a full one. So, well, there's a radial one that goes straight across that's just like putting these two. Um, you know, putting this together with the analog of this going to the other direction, okay, and shifting it. But what about, what about, and this one comes out after, again, the same periodicity. That's by symmetry, so we don't have to <laughs> do anything about that. Now, what about the ones that don't have, that have some, so the projection of that one, but, okay, now I can start drawing this, projection of that one down to the Poincaré disk is one that goes from one end 
you know, x equal to zero, in this case, x equal to infinity to x equal to zero. So here again, the projection is symmetric. What about the ones that have some angular momentum? Well, you might, if you take a cylinder in flat space time, it certainly takes shorter time because it's shorter distance to go straight through than going around. In ADS, things conspire such that even the, all the geodesics, no matter what the angular momentum is, end up reconverging at the antipodal point. So going around the boundary takes the same you know, time in this sense, not, not in proper time, of course, proper time is zero, but in this coordinate time sense as going in any other direction. And in fact, we have seen the surface. The surface is nothing but a Poincaré horizon of a Poincaré ADS that's tacked to this. Okay, so you can, you can combine a Poincaré horizon shift the other Poincaré horizon up or whatever, and those generators, the horizon generators of the horizon, of the Poincaré horizon are now geodesics. And so from those, you can, again, using all the other symmetries, you can describe any null geodesic. Okay, so that's what null geodesics look like. Now this is getting a bit of a mess. Uh, okay, maybe I should, well, okay. Um, and as far as saying what probes feel, that's about as far as you can go because nothing physical propagates in a space-like direction. Nevertheless, it's amazing, well, it's, it's very useful to think about space-like geodesics, even though nothing propagates around them, as a probe of the geometry. And in fact, it turns out that there are quantities in the CFT that behave, well, whose, for example, values you can compute by studying space-like geodesics or in general, maybe higher dimensional you know, extremal surfaces that are space-like. So the space-likeness uh, doesn't bother us at all. Okay, so what do space-like geodesics look like? Ah, let me first complete so, so um, the null geodesics would project the constant uh, T in this fashion. So these are null projections of of null geodesics. Here, that's even easier. You start from x equal to zero, and you go in a straight line with some momentum, because this is just a flat space, and null geodesics, well, null geodesics in, in conformally flat space behave the same way as in flat space, because they don't care about the conformal factor. And so we can make the trick of drawing straight lines and then conformally transforming um, um, to, 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 to go here. But, okay, so that, that's going to be what the null geodesics do. Now, what about the space-like ones? Um, we can't use that trick, but we can almost use that trick. If a geodesic in flat space is a straight line, geodesic now it's going to be in this Poincaré thing is going to be a circle, a semicircle. So space-like geodesics, uh, I haven't established a color convention, so let me use, say, oh, let me use yellow, that might be more visible. Okay, so space-like geodesics are going to, let's say, anchored at x and minus x. Here are going to be semicircles. They have two endpoints. They want to go and end on the boundary. So here, well, one space like geodesic is, is again, obvious by symmetry, that's this one. Um, it's not manifest in these coordinates, but it's manifest here, because this is flip symmetric. The other ones, well, here, as you go in this neighborhood, it's like going in this neighborhood. So here it's locally going to, if you zoom in on this part, it's going to look like this. So there will be geodesics that look that limit to semicircles, and in between, they interpolate looking like this. And of course, you can, once you have some family of them, you can again rotate the thing um, around using the global rotational symmetry to get any other space like geodesic. Okay, so they, they're all sort of related by the symmetry. So once you have one, you, you can get, in principle, any other one. 
here, so here, well, this is going to be hard to draw, but you can imagine this diagram <laughs> tilted up. But one nice thing is if you foliate this, let me erase the timeline geodesics, I'm making too much of a mess here. Um, if you foliate the Poincare horizon with constant tau surfaces, okay, so constant tau surface is something that looks like that. So you take, a, you take the intersection of these two, co-dimension one, oh, sorry, uh, let's just do 3D ADS for, <laughs> for the moment. Uh, if you do, if you foliate this ADS3 with constant, so it's a constant two-dimensional, sorry, uh, a null two-dimensional surface, a space-like two-dimensional surface, the intersection is one-dimensional curve. That one-dimensional curve, so a constant, constant T uh, slice of this is precisely one of these space-like geodesics. Again, because of the large symmetry of ADS. So you can slice the Poincaré horizon uh, either, well, you can, you can generate it by these null geodesics, and the slices of it are uh, space-like geodesics in three dimensions or extremal surfaces um, in higher dimensions. Okay, so that's, that's just sort of building up intuition for the, for the geometry. Okay, so now, um, I can start developing some of the map. Let's, okay, let me pause first for questions. And let me check how much time I have. Three minutes, okay. So questions for three minutes, or I'll sketch a first ingredient of the dictionary. Yeah. This one? No, no, the, the, so this one. Yeah, Which this, color? This one? No, the, the one below. So this, this one? This is a constant tau surface? Yes. Okay. Okay. Yes. This is a constant tau surface. Uh, well, in, in this case, this is constant T surface as well, but if you shift it up and down, it's, it, it, it is constant T, uh, constant tau. Yeah, so it's 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 just it's just uh, here or here or. Yeah. Okay, so notice one thing that I'll start with next time, which will generate that observation will motivate the so-called scale radius duality or UVIR correspondence, that. If you want to see, say, say you're probing the space-time with these space-like geodesics, if you have a, a distance, let's say some, some distance here, epsilon or something, in the z direction, or then, or two epsilon, so let's say this is at x equal to epsilon endpoint, here we have z equal to epsilon, the, the, the circle, the semicircle reaches down to the same distance. So this geodesic, the smaller distance it's ending on, the nearer to the boundary it probes. Conversely, if you have far separated endpoints, the deeper in the bulk it reaches. And it turns out, so I already motivated that Z really should be like an energy scale. So the scale radius duality, and I'll write this again, but um, it's just that it's convenient now that I have the pictures, simply is a uh, phrasing, more precise phrasing of this observation that the energy scale corresponds to a, well, radius is sort of silly, but it's sort of the, 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 the uh, position, the radial, the level of the radial coordinate. Okay, so if you have, and it's also called UVIR, uh, because if you're in the, say you want to put a short distance, a UV cutoff on the field theory, so large energy, short distance, that's UV, that's like putting a cutoff, so say you can't probe physics on, on such a small scale, 
that means that these sort of probes are not sensible, so you're not sensitive to the physics out here near the boundary. So it's like an IR cutoff in the bulk. In the global ABS picture, that would be like a you know, large distance cutoff here. Uh, the precise set of um, mathematical co correspondence uh, holds in this limit as you go to the ADS boundary or for this Poincaré uh, picture. In global ADS, of course, at some point, that, that breaks down. So in global ADS or asymptotic ADS, you should think of this m more as a heuristic or as just a boundary statement. But this, already this observation that sort of UV scale in the boundary corresponds to being near the boundary and you know, the large distances correspond to being deeper in the bulk, allows you to build up intuition for even like dynamical processes. Say you have a particle that you put here at initial time, it's going to start falling into ADS because it feels this gravitational potential well. The same process describes from the field theory point of view it's just you're putting in some localized excitation and under time evolution that localized excitation spreads out. Both of them are perfectly physical and expected, but, but, but they're just dual of each other. So it's, you're really describing the same process in two different ways. Okay, so there's a limit to which you can push this, but uh, uh, again, once you start getting away from this Poincaré ADS geometry to sort of deforming this or taking, being sensitive to the compactness of the, of the sphere, then, then you have to be very careful. Okay, so we'll start there uh, next time. And I want to sort of, eventually what I want to do in the last lecture is sort of riff off on this sort of causal set type constructions, not causal set in technical, wait, just, just the causal constructs to sort of tell you how much power there is in, in just that type of reasoning in making statements about the dual constructs. Okay, again, as, a, as an applied GR in this ADS-CFD context. Okay, so that's where we'll, that's where we'll, what we'll build up to tomorrow.